Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well this evening. How was your first day? Yeah. You know, perhaps you've got through the most difficult part of the retreat now. Uh, sometimes the first day is the hardest day. Um, it's uh, and if you had a wonderful day, don't let me tell you otherwise. Uh, I, I like retreat. I've done a lot of retreat. It's a lot of fun. But sometimes the first day is a transition uh, from our busy lives and getting in the groove of things um, can take a second. So if you notice it was a tough day, well, could be, um, and it will be better. People have done retreat before you. Uh, a lot of people have done retreat. And it's maybe helpful to know there is a pattern to it. Um, you know, day one can be a particular way, day four can be a particular way, day three, and so on. And so you're doing what has been done before. And that same idea, I think, is really, I find comforting when I think about the meditation training as well. Um, what we are learning and talking about has been done before for thousands of years. Yeah. Um, we read from the suttas. We uh, practice meditation that has been practiced by people who devote their entire life to it. Um, and so we are not reinventing something ourselves. We are simply uh, discovering at how it works for us. In the morning, we took refuge in the Triple Gem, in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. So this is another comfort, another refuge in what we're doing. So when we take refuge in that, uh, I think it's helpful to really pay attention to your mind when you do that. It's kind of like when you relax. How does your mind go when you're taking refuge in these? Um, when we take refuge in the Buddha, it means we're remembering and remembering our confidence in the teachings of the historical Buddha, the uh, recluse Gotama. Um, so he was a human who became, became awakened and he was able to teach that to other people so we can learn about it as well. Um, the Dhamma, when we take a reference in the Dhamma, is the teachings of the Buddha. Well, the Dhamma can mean the teachings and Dhamma also means truth. So the Dhamma should be very true, very obvious, so obvious of course it's that way when you understand what the Dhamma is. And hopefully um, it can be presented that way sometimes. Um, and then there is the Sangha. Uh, the Sangha is the community of monks uh, and nuns, the monastics who have helped transmit this information over thousands of years to us and uh, maintain the tradition uh, and rituals and processes of it. Um, and the community of practitioners as well. Uh, we as lay people are very important uh, members of the Sangha. We help support the monastic community and we practice. And um, how we practice, our conditions are a little different than monastic conditions, but uh, we can practice uh, with the same teachings. So, yeah, remembering the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha uh, can be a comfort and bring confidence. Remember those who have done this before us. And what they've done is train their mind. We are learning to train our mind. A trained mind is about the most wonderful thing we can imagine. And we can't really imagine how wonderful it is, actually. The human mind can has amazing capacities for memorization, for cognition, 
for perception that we as modern people really don't understand. What we do understand well is the untrained mind. The untrained mind, as wonderful as the trained mind is, the untrained mind is quite the same in how difficult it can be. The untrained mind brings us suffering, um, or it can bring us suffering. You know, what brings us anxiety, brings us thoughts that don't make sense, that are not important. And we spend a lot of our time thinking about things that are not even true, worrying about things that could never happen. And yep, I think we're all familiar with that. So retreat is a wonderful time to actually work on training our mind. So with the trained mind, we can bring joy to ourselves, to our community and those around us like that. So training the mind, uh, we use meditation for that. That's what we're up to here. But to be successful in your practice, we need a foundation. So meditation is one part of the practice. Uh, we can name three parts, maybe. Sila, Dana, and Abhavana. These translate as uh, morality, generosity, and meditation. Uh, so in English, uh, morality is maybe not a pleasant word. It brings up um, ideas of right and wrong, being bad, being a good person or a bad person like that. And we don't mean it that way in this training. Uh, this is a very pragmatic approach to how we train our mind. We think of it in terms of positive and negative outcomes or wholesome and unwholesome outcomes of our mind. Uh, one of the trainings in morality and sila are the precepts we take in the morning. Uh, we decide not to harm beings on purpose, to not take what's not given, to avoid sexual activity, to avoid harsh speech, telling lies, slander of speech and gossip, and so on, alcohol and drugs. These are training rules. We bring them out into the world, of course, uh, it is never a good idea to harm another being and so on. But we use them here to learn what our mind will do before it, we do something. When we keep the precepts, we know what we're going to do before we do it. When we keep the precepts, we allow our mind uh, a chance to be calm. And conversely, breaking precepts um, will lead to a mind that is less calm and happy. It will help us generate hindrances. So, as I said this morning, if you find yourself accidentally breaking a precept, that happens, and take the precepts again immediately. When you break a precept, um, the procedure is pretty simple. You notice you break the precept. Uh, maybe you feel a little remorse about it or concern. I don't mean you beat yourself up, but you're like, oh no, uh, I did not mean to do that. Then you forgive yourself, um, forgive yourself for breaking it because you're human, you know, you probably didn't mean to. You make the determination to not break the precept again in the future, and then you take the precepts. That simple. You can do that as many times as you need to, but hopefully not many. When we break precepts, um, not accidentally necessarily, but in some degree, uh, we do that because we take things personally. When we think about the precepts, these are pretty obvious things we don't want done to us, right? We don't want to be harmed or killed. We don't want our things taken. We don't want to be lied to or have our speech, right? And so we know, uh, that we, that other people do not want that to happen. When we choose to do that, we are putting our interests, our needs, our personal, uh, 
personal needs are above the other person's. And it is leading to disharmony. Uh, but we're choosing to do that because we're taking our feelings, our needs, our feelings driving our behavior personally and letting them control what we do. When we allow ourselves to have our feelings control our behavior, even when it leads to negative outcomes, we reinforce negative patterns of thought, deed, speech, and thought. Of course, this leads to conflict internally, whether or not we know it. And of course, this conflict will come up when we sit and we have a chance to be calm. So we say not in conflict with the world, not in conflict with ourselves, not in conflict with our community, but keeping the precepts. And when we do that, we gain uh, the ability to know what we'll do and a mind that is prepared to observe what is happening. And that's why we do it. It's not about being a good person or something bad happening because you do something. It is about, well, it is about that, isn't it? It's about your mind uh, becoming unwholesome. So wholesome and unwholesome. These are other words that can be triggering um, for some people. Uh, when I've taught these words before, I've been told that you know, they don't like wholesome or unwholesome. I, what unwholesome and wholesome means is um, leading to positive outcome is wholesome. Unwholesome is leading to negative outcome, taking things personally, simply like that. Unwholesome actions um, are basically breaking precepts. In the suttas, you'll find the list of the 10 unwholesome courses of action and they're breaking precepts, causing harm, lying, stealing, like that. Wholesome leads to our good, our benefit, our clarity of mind, and so on. So I've been talking about taking things personally a lot and meditation is we're observing how mind works and what happens so we can observe what happens in our body and mind as part of an impersonal process so that deserves some unpacking When something happens, when perhaps uh, we have sight, when a form, when light meets, meets a working eye and consciousness is present, uh, the meaning of these three we call contact. This is the beginning of sensory perception. Based on contact, eye contact, eye feeling arises. We have a feeling that comes up. Feeling in and of itself is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Based on I feeling, I craving arises. Craving is a contraction. It's a tension and tightness. It is a pulling away. It is the beginning of taking things personally. It is the beginning of the feeling, being just pleasant or unpleasant, being my feeling, my nose itches. First, there's an itch, and maybe it's unpleasant. Then my nose itches and becomes an emergency because my nose is itching. After craving comes clinging, and this is the beginning of thinking about it and reflecting on it. When we start taking things personally, we start being affected by craving. We start being pulled into 
trying to control, thinking about, being involved in, mine. When we take things impersonally, we can see this as a process. And the difference is quite a bit. The difference between a painful feeling and suffering is I. When you bonk your finger, a painful feeling arises. When your finger is hurt, now you have to do something about it, right? Now, I don't like it when my fingers hurt. Is it broken? What am I going to do? And before long, you have an emotional reaction. You have a, uh, a set of actions that you may do, and you do something about it. Yeah. What I'm talking about, we call dependent origination. This is the core of the Buddhist texts and the Buddhist practice. Seeing our experience through an impersonal lens. When we can see it through an impersonal lens, we can take it, uh, we have a, the choice to take it personally or impersonally. When we take it impersonally, we can let go of suffering like that. So what affects us so it is difficult to take it impersonally? Um, well, first, this is very fast. When a feeling arises, craving happens very quickly. The tension happens very quickly. Feeling, tension, thought, before you know it, you're lost. It takes a calm mind and a collected mind to begin to observe this. Um, and our hindrances, uh, they start interfering as well. When we sit down uh, to observe the movements of mind attention and meditate, well, these days, you sit down, you bring up the feeling of loving kindness, warm feeling in the chest, you make a wish for yourself, for your friend, may I be happy, and you stay with that wish. And then something happens. Maybe it's a memory or maybe it's a thought. And when your mindfulness is sharp, then you notice that and you can six R, relax and let it go and come back. When you six R, you're letting go of craving. When we recognize that mind is distracted, we redirect our attention to relaxing the body and mind. When we relax the body and mind, there's an openness. This is the mind without craving. When we relax, we let go of that tension and tightness. And our mind in that moment is clear without craving without suffering. And we bring that back to our smile and to our object of meditation. This process is called right effort. Right effort is de defined uh, in the text as um, letting go of an unwholesome state that has arisen and preventing uh, unarisen, unwholesome states from arising, to allow wholesome states to arise, and to allow wholesome states that have arisen to persist. Just like that. So let go of the unwholesome uh, and bring up the wholesome. When we 6R, that's exactly what we do. So if you have an arisen, wholesome state of mind, unwholesome state of mind, if we're not mindful, we may try to control it, try to push it away, try to change it. And our attachment allows it to persist, yeah? The attachment prevents it from arising 
and going away as the nature of all things is. Just be able to come up and go away. Anything that arises, the nature of it is to uh, go away. Unless we're involved, unless we're taking it personally, unless there's attachment there. When we recognize it's there, when we release and redirect our attention, we stop uh, feeding it. We stop giving it more nutriment, more attachment to keep it there. And so there's a, there's a chance now that it can go away, that it can, that it can go away. We then redirect our attention to relaxing our mind and body, letting go of craving and bringing up the wholesome with our smile and loving kindness. And we keep that going. That's right effort. The more we can do that with whatever arises, the more we can see our experience as part of an impersonal process. The more we can connect with our experience and let it be there as it is. This is training our mind. In a mind without craving, there is no suffering. When we think about what happens in our mind and body, we can use a schema called the five aggregates. The five aggregates are the five piles. These are five ways to classify everything that happens in our body and mind. They are form, feeling, perception, dhammas or thoughts, and consciousness. So form, uh, form is the four elements. Uh, the four elements are what makes up uh, our perception of the world of solidity. The four elements are uh, solidness, cohesion, heat, and vibration. Uh, any kind of tactile experience, you can think of in terms of the four elements. Feeling is feeling. Sensation, pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant nor unpleasant, neutral. There are other ways of defining feeling, maybe up to 108 different kinds of feeling. I don't think we have to do that. We can just say that. Perception is the part of the mind that names things, that knows a chair is a chair, a table is a table, and it has memory with it, like that. And dhammas, well, dhammas is everything else almost we think of. Uh, these are thoughts, these are ideas, uh, concepts about things. Love and kindness is a Dhamma, uh, for example. And consciousness. Consciousness is what the capacity to cognize the rest of the aggregates, to be aware of it. The aggregates when we can classify our experience in different ways, we can understand how it is impersonal. When we can see how these things work, we can see that indeed they are happening on their own. Like that. And when we can do that, we can, we can see them as impersonal, uh, then we can let them go and we have choice and we can let go of suffering. There are several, uh, several contemplations that are particularly useful, uh, and the five aggregates is one of them. When we understand the aggregates and understand how all the aggregates are not self, um, that sets us up uh, for dispassion and for uh, awakening. So tonight we're going to read a sutta. Uh, this is Sutta 152. It is called The Development of the Faculties. 
This is the last sutta in the Majima Nikaya, so we probably should start our first Dhamma talk with it, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like this sutta a lot because it talks about how we think about our observation and how we approach our meditation and observation. Now, the faculties, there are five faculties. By the way, this is a reason I was very interested in Theravada, uh, why I learned about this when I was much younger. Theravada offers, or Suttavada, uh, the suttas, early Buddhism, offers a very clear training system. There are classifications for everything we do. There are lists of things, there's vocabulary words. It's an education that you can learn and when you learn it, you put it together, you understand the system. And not only that, when you understand the system, you can gauge your progress on the suttas and on the texts. And so you know what might happen and you can gauge that with what your experience is. I think that's a, a great thing about this. Um, though, over the course of, uh, of time, you'll, be, you'll encounter many lists and you may not remember them all, and that's okay. Like, that's absolutely okay. Uh, eventually, uh, you may. So, the five faculties, uh, these are faith or confidence, uh, energy, mindfulness, collectedness, and wisdom. We talked a little bit about confidence. Confidence is confidence that the Buddha was awakened and he taught something valuable. Uh, even farther, confidence that he knew exactly what he was talking about, was fully awakened, perfectly awakened. Confidence in the Dhamma and confidence in the teachings. The five faculties are qualities we develop so we can progress along the path. These were very praised as when, when you develop these, these will take you closer to awakening. Confidence takes us all the way through and is our companion through. Now, another wonderful thing about the suttas is there's very little you have to take on faith in the long term. There's very little that you cannot verify yourself. The Dhamma is meant to be verified. Uh, you're meant to hear about it and explore it and see if it works the way it's supposed to or how does it work. Confidence is the motivation to keep going, that there is something there. And there are some things that you'll hear and you don't know exactly what they mean and the confidence to keep going to try to figure out what that's exactly about. Energy is persistence. It is applied effort. It is putting the a right amount of attention and effort into what you do. It does take energy to sit in a chair, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Takes energy to keep six Ring and bringing your mind back. And this is, uh, this is the faculty of energy to keep going. Then there's the faculty of mindfulness, which we talked about. Mindfulness is the ability to observe the movements of mind attention as it moves from thing to thing. Mindfulness powers our meditation. When we're mindful, we can do the practice. When we lose our mindfulness, then we learn from our hindrances. And collectedness. Collectedness, uh, this refers to jhana, to unification of mind. We, it is helpful to collect the mind, make it sharper, bring up its capacities. When we collect the mind with jhana, which we talked a little bit about last night, it is able to see things more and more clearly our level of understanding increases. 
So we practice meditation, allow mind to collect, and this allows us our wisdom to develop as well. Wisdom is observation. And when you see wisdom in the suttas, it means observing dependent origination, observing the impersonal process of dependent origination. So when you read the suttas and you hear about someone's wisdom or attending wisely, they're talking about attending in such a way that they can see how things work. We develop wisdom uh, as our mind becomes settled, as our mindfulness is developed, as we apply our energy, and as our confidence uh, allows us to move forward. So, the development of the faculties. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Kanjagala in a grove of Mukela trees. Then the Brahmin student Uttara, a pupil of the Brahmin Parasarya, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down on one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Uttara, does the Brahmin Parasarya teach his disciples the development of the faculties? He does, Master Gotama. But Uttara, how does he teach his disciples the development of the faculties? Here, Master Gotama, one does not see forms with the eye. One does not hear sounds with the ear. This is how the Brahmin Parasarya teaches his disciples the development of the faculties. If that is so, Uttara, then a blind man and a deaf man will have developed faculties according to what the Brahmin Parasarya says. For a blind man does not see forms with the eye and a deaf man does not hear sounds with the ear. I think that's pretty harsh criticism of that way of cultivation. What they're talking about here is a way of meditating that shuts down the faculties and the sense doors uh, early on in the process. And so mind is internally uh, only present and the process of the sense stores cannot be seen. Uh, the Buddha did not praise that because it is very difficult to develop wisdom or understanding of how your sense faculties work when they're shut down, when they're not happening, to say the least. When this was said, the Brahmin student Atara, Parasarya's pupil, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum, and without response. When we're practicing TWIM, we practice in such a way that our sense doors can operate, and we have the possibility of distraction. We don't praise distraction or want distraction, but we want to have the ability to know how things work. We develop a particular kind of collectedness that is open, spacious, and allows movement so we can see things happen in finer and finer grain uh, focus. When we can see them happen uh, better and better, we can 6R, relax, and allow our mind to get more and more calm. We start out letting go of thoughts and images and movies. We can let go of words, then we can let go of tension, and we can let go uh, even more as mind gets deeper and deeper. Then knowing this, the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, the Brahmin Parasarya, teaches his disciples the development of the faculties in one way, but in the Noble One's discipline, the supreme development of the faculties is otherwise. Now, the supreme development of the faculties is the complete development of the faculties of one who is completely awakened. We, uh, we practice with faculties that are not fully developed, but that's okay. This is how we approach them and this is how they work. 
Now is the time, blessed one. Now is the time, sublime one, for the blessed one to teach the development, the supreme development of the faculties and the noble one's discipline. Having heard it from the blessed one, the monks will remember it. Then listen, Ananda, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, he said. The blessed one said this. Now, Ananda, how is there the supreme development of the faculties in the noble one's discipline? Here, Ananda, when a monk sees a form with the eye, there arises in him what is agreeable, there arises what is disagreeable, there arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. This is a pleasant state, an unpleasant state, and a neutral state in response to what was seen. He understands thus, there has arisen in me what is agreeable, there has arisen in me what is disagreeable, there has arisen in me what is both agreeable and disagreeable. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen. This is peaceful, this is sublime, that is equanimity. Equanimity. Equanimity is a way of observing what happens without being involved. When you observe with equanimity, your mind is not repelled, it's not attracted, it just happens. So you can observe things clearly without getting involved. Equanimity does not mean indifference. Indifference also is not reacting to what's happening around. But indifference has delusion and indifference has a closing down of observation. Equanimity sees clearly. And when you view with equ equanimity, you see what happens without being uh, pushed away or pulled. The agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and the disagreeable that arose cease in him and equanimity is established. Just as a man with good sight, having opened his eyes, might shut them, or having shut his eyes might open them, so too concerning anything at all, the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose, cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. This is called in the Noble One's discipline the supreme development of the faculties regarding forms cognizable by the eye. So how do we practice this? Well, it's the six R's. When a sight arises, when a form cognizable by the eye leads to a pleasant or unpleasant or neutral feeling, and it pulls us in, we recognize that. We release that and let it be there as it is with equanimity. We relax our head and body and smile, and we come back to our object of meditation. That is how we develop the faculties. What is also interesting about this is how quickly it happens. Just as quickly as someone opening their eyes, this happens. This is important when we're working on our meditation, when we're developing our insight in how things work. If we're not observing things and watching them over and over for long periods of time. We just see as they are, quickly, simply. What we see is what we see. We don't look deeper into it and keep looking at it, then it becomes our object of meditation. When we do that, when we look at it, when we take it as an object, a different progression of meditation happens. Again, Ananda, when a monk hears a sound with the ear, 
there arises in him what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He understands thus. There has arisen in me what is agreeable. There has arisen in me what is disagreeable. There has arisen what is both agreeable and disagreeable. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen. This is peaceful. This is sublime. That is equanimity. That is observation. The agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease in him and equanimity is established. Just as a strong man might easily snap his fingers, so too concerning anything at all, the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. This is called the noble, in the noble one's discipline, the supreme development of the faculties regarding sounds cognizable by the ear. And you notice it was written, so too concerning anything at all. This is anything that arises. When you're with your object of meditation, anything that is not your object of meditation that pulls your attention, you can let go. Some thoughts seem important and some thoughts are. Perhaps if the, if we had a fire here, that would be an important thought that you might break your meditation for pretty much anything else is not worth attending to. When you have a really important thought, um, okay, then make a mental note. Say, thank you thought. I will please come up later. See you later. Make a determination that that will happen and then forget about it and then move on. Sometimes thoughts keep coming back and coming back. Now, when a thought comes back and comes back, that is a sign there is attachment in that thought. Whatever it is comes back. And when you think about that, it's really not that efficient, is it, that you would think the same thought over and over again. That's not that useful. You had the thought, you thought it through, yep, and, and now here it is again. That's even funny, yeah? That's even funny. And that noticing it's funny, noticing it's silly, is very helpful for your practice. We have thoughts that seem so important and so big and so critical. And they come up again and again, proving that they're not that profound actually at all. And when we can laugh at them, when we can laugh at ourselves for having them, these thoughts can be seen for what they are as not the emergency they're presenting themselves to be. When you can smile at yourself, when you can laugh with yourself, um, you can let go of almost anything. Letting go doesn't mean you ignore it. Yeah. It doesn't mean you uh, pretend it's not there. It doesn't mean you don't act on it when it's appropriate, but it's, uh, doesn't have to be taken as the emergency that it is, particularly when you're meditating. Yeah. Some thoughts come up and they have insight and they have information and it comes up once and it's like, Oh, that's how that works. That's okay. That's going to happen. Don't, don't six are those thoughts. Uh, why would you, those thoughts come up one time and go away and you know what they say. And, uh, unless you start thinking about it, um, they will go away. Uh, insight can be like that. Insight is simple, clear, uh, and undeniable. When you observe what's happening, it's simple and clear and as it is. As simply as you see a chair before you or whatever it is. So when you have insight into your experience, it's like that. Looking deeper than that, um, 
Well, you start going into the realm of concepts sometimes. You start not seeing things as they are exactly. Yeah. You start pulling away from what is present as it is. Again, Ananda, when a monk smells an odor with the nose, there arises in him what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He understands thus. There has arisen in me what's agreeable. There has arisen what is disagreeable. There has arisen what is both agreeable and disagreeable. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen. This is peaceful. This is sublime. That is equanimity. The agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease in him and equanimity is established. Just as raindrops on a slightly sloping lotus leaf roll off and do not remain there, so too concerning anything at all, the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and the equanimity is established. This is called in the Noble One's Discipline the supreme development of the faculties regarding odors cognizable by the nose. You may have noticed these paragraphs are repeating and there's different, uh, there's different analogies, but it's the same words over and over. And this is on purpose. Uh, the suttas were an oral tradition for at least three or 400 years after the Buddha's death. They were not written down. They were remembered by monks in monasteries who would memorize them. The repetition uh, allows for memorization. And the repetition is also a training tool. When you hear repetition, I would encourage you to listen to it as carefully as you can, as attentively as you can. Sometimes when you hear the same things over and over again, you hear something new. It comes out in a new way. You can hear it in a different way when you attend to it. And it's like that with this. There are some places in the, in the text where they take out the repetition. Um, and so when eventually you read the suttas, notice that. I think it is valuable when you read them to yourself, when you memorize them, if you memorize them. By the way, that is a wonderful practice. Eventually, uh, after retreat, picking a sutta and memorizing it. When you memorize a sutta, it never leaves you. Uh, and you keep understanding it more and more as, it, as, it's, uh, as you think about it whenever you want. And it comes to you. There are several that are really useful to memorize. And if uh, you want to talk about that later, let's do that. But the, with the repetition, um, it, it's a tool for training. As you hear it over and over again, you will remember it better. And as you remember it better, you will remember it in your practice better. And sometimes these things come to you right when, uh, right when they're needed. Again, Ananda, when a monk tastes a flavor with the tongue, there arises in him what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He understands thus. There has arisen in me what is agreeable. There has arisen what is disagreeable. There has arisen what is both agreeable and disagreeable. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen. This is peaceful. This is sublime. That is equanimity. The agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease in him and equanimity is established. Just as a strong man might easily spit out a ball of spittle collected on the tip of his tongue, so too concerning anything at all, the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as nobly, and equanimity is established. This is called in the Noble One's Discipline the supreme development of the faculties regarding flavors cognizable by the tongue. 
just as easily and just as effortlessly. This is an effortless process in faculties that are well-developed. The six R's is an effortless process. Basically, you recognize, you release, you relax, you smile, you come back. There is no trying or pushing. You may adjust your interests, you may adjust your energy, you may back, back off with your observation a little bit here and there. But ultimately, things pass without effort. They persist without effort. They're observed without effort. They just happen. Again, Ananda, when a monk touches a tangible with the body, there arises in him what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He understands thus. There has arisen in me what is agreeable. There has arisen what is disagreeable. There has arisen what is both agreeable and disagreeable. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen. This is peaceful. This is sublime. That is equanimity. The agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease in him and equanimity is established. Just as a strong man might extend his flexed arm or flex his extended arm, so too concerning anything at all, the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. This is called in the Noble One's discipline the supreme development of the faculties regarding tangibles cognizable by the body. Again, Ananda, when a monk cognizes a mind object with the mind, there arises in him what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He understands thus. There has arisen in me what is agreeable. There has arisen what is disagreeable. There has arisen what is both agreeable and disagreeable. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen, this is peaceful, this is sublime, that is equanimity. The agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose, and both uh, that arose cease in him, and the equanimity is established. Just as a man were to let two or three drops of water fall onto an iron plate heated for a whole day, the falling of the drops might be slow, but they would quickly vaporize and vanish. So too concerning anything at all, the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and both the agreeable and the disagreeable that arose cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. This is called in the Noble One's discipline the supreme development of the faculties regarding ideas cognizable by the mind. This is how there is the supreme development of the faculties in the Noble One's discipline. And how Ananda is one a, a disciple in higher training who has entered upon the way. A disciple in higher training is a person who has uh, entered one of the stages of awakening. When they have entered one of the stages of awakening, they have experienced Nibbana um, at least to some degree. When the Nibbana is the unconditioned, not a conditioned uh, experience. This context of having that reference point of the unconditioned changes one's relation to the faculties and to what arises. And here uh, the Buddha is talking about how the faculties can be developed in this way. When a monk sees a form with the eye, there, arise, uh, there arises in him what is agreeable, there arises what is disagreeable, there arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He is repelled. 
humiliated and disgusted by the agreeable that arose, by the disagreeable that arose, and by both by the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose. That is strong language. And it can seem aversive that, um, that we are supposed to be disgusted by our experience. And this is not what it is saying. Uh, this is talking about the process of developing disenchantment with the sense faculties. The process of disenchantment is when something arises and pulls your attention a hundred times, a thousand times, many, many times, and you let go over and over again, eventually your mind gets tired of it. It gets tired of it on a deep and profound level. You cannot consciously induce disenchantment. It happens on a deep level. When disenchantment happens, you start seeing that there's nothing to be clung to in whatever arises. With just disenchantment, just passion arises and you truly uh, become detached. Someone who has understood this process, when they are training their faculties and something arises, using words like humiliated and repelled and so on are more appropriate. Until, uh, until that is your experience and you understand the context of that, it's not important to decide your experience is humiliating or disgusting. And in fact, I do not suggest you do that at all. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about how to train the mind so it automatically automatically uh, applies six R's and automatically responds to distraction in the way we're talking about here. So that's how to understand that. The eye itself is not humiliating. When a monk hears a sound with the ear, there arises in him what is, what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He is repelled, humiliated, and disgusted by the agreeable that arose, by the disagreeable that arose, and by both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose. When a monk spells an odor with the nose, there arises in him what is agreeable, there arises what is disagreeable, there arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He is repelled, humiliated, and disgusted by the agreeable that arose by the disagreeable that arose, and by the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose. When a monk tastes a flavor with the tongue, there arises in him what is agreeable, there arises what is disagreeable, there arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He is repelled, humiliated, and disgusted by the agreeable that arose, by the disagreeable that arose, and by both agreeable and disagreeable that arose. When a monk touches the tangible with the body, there arises in him what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He is repelled, humiliated, and disgusted by the agreeable that arose, by the disagreeable that arose, and by both the agreeable and disagreeable that arose. When a monk cognizes a mind object with the mind, there arises in him what is agreeable, there arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He is repelled, humiliated, and disgusted by the agreeable that arose, by the disagreeable by a that arose, and by, both agree and by the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose. This is how one is a disciple in higher training, one who has entered upon the way. And how Ananda, is one a noble one with developed faculties. Here, when a monk sees a form with the eyes, there arises what is disagreeable, there arises what is agreeable, there arises what is disagreeable. If he should wish, may I abide perceiving the unrepulsive and the repulsive? He abides perceiving the unrepulsive and the repulsive. If he should wish, may I abide perceiving the repulsive and the unrepulsive? He abides perceiving the repulsive and the unrepulsive. 
if he should wish, may abide perceiving the unrepulsive and the repulsive and the repulsive, he abides perceiving the unrepulsive in that. If he should wish, may I abide perceiving the repulsive and the unrepulsive, he abides perceiving the repulsive in that. If he should wish, may I, avoid, may I, avoiding both the repulsive and the repulsive, abide in equanimity, mindfully and fully aware. He abides in equanimity towards that, mindfully, fully aware. This is how an this is how one is a noble one with developed faculties. What this is talking about here is different modes of perception of what arises. When one has fully developed faculties, one can perceive uh, agreeable as uh, agreeable in the unagreeable. That is, one can pervade that with loving kindness or one automatically can see that as its component parts. And when that happens, the unagreeable um, is, uh, is agreeable. We can do that uh, pervading uh, with loving kindness. The training we really do here with the six R's is the last one. Um, May I, avoiding both the repulsive and the unrepulsive, abide in equanimity, mindful and fully aware. When we do the six R's, we abide mindful, fully aware, and we avoid getting engaged with the agreeable or the disagreeable, like that. So this paragraph is describing the faculties of an arahat, one is fully developed, what they can do effortlessly, and is also describing uh, courses of training that people in training engage in, uh, pervading loving kindness, uh, uh, practicing the six R's. Uh, there's a couple of other practices here that are implied, um, like observing impermanence or uh, working with repulsiveness of the body. These are other practices that we may talk about later. These are full development of these practices that can be automatically done when mind is fully developed. For our purposes, we're talking about abiding with equanimity, mindfully and fully aware. And we're not projecting uh, uh, pleasant things on unpleasant things or deciding unpleasant things are pleasant. It's a slightly different, different thing. When a monk sees a form uh, sees a sound with an ear, uh, there arises in him what is agreeable, there arises what is disagreeable, there arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. If he should wish, may I abide, perceiving the unrepulsive and the repulsive, may I abide with loving kindness. He abides, perceiving the unrepulsive and the, and the repulsive. If he should wish, may I abide, perceiving the repulsive and the unrepulsive, he abides, perceiving the repulsive and the unrepulsive. If he should wish, may I abide perceiving the unrepulsive and the repulsive and the unrepulsive. He abides perceiving the unrepulsive in that. If he should wish, may I abide perceiving the repulsive and the rep unrepulsive and the repulsive. He abides perceiving the repulsive in that. If he should wish, may I, avoiding both the repulsive and the unrepulsive, abide in equanimity, mindful and fully aware. He abides in equanimity towards that mindful and fully aware. That is how one is a noble one with developed faculties. Here, Nanda, when a monk sees, tastes a flavor with the tongue, touches a tangible with the body, or cognizes a mind object with the mind. I skipped over a few there. There arises in him what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. If he should wish, may abide, perceiving the unrepulsive and the repulsive. He abides, perceiving the unrepulsive and the repulsive. If he should wish, may abide, perceiving the repulsive and the unrepulsive. He abides, perceiving the repulsive and the unrepulsive. If he should wish, may abide, perceiving the unrepulsive and the repulsive and the unrepulsive. He abides, per perceiving the unrepulsive and that. If he should wish, may I abide perceiving the, um, the repulsive and the unrepulsive and the repulsive. He abides perceiving the repulsive in that. If he should wish, 
May I, avoiding both the repulsive and the unrepulsive, abide in equanimity mindfully and fully aware. He abides in equanimity towards that mindful and fully aware. That is how a one is a noble one with developed faculties. So, Ananda, the supreme development of the faculties and the noble one's discipline has been taught by me. The disciple in higher training who has entered upon the way has been taught by me. And the noble one with developed faculties has been taught by me. What should be done for his disciples out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and has compassion for them? That I have done for you, Ananda. There are these roots of trees, these empty huts. Meditate, Ananda. Do not delay, or else you will regret it later. This is our instruction to you. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Okay, let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.